globalization law, a project that sorry, a project that unites several uh, universities uh, in the Netherlands. So uh, UVA with the Sustainable Global Economic Law Project. Tilburg with constitutionalizing the Anthropocene, Philip and Marie and Laura and others are here from Tilburg, um, uh, Maastricht University and Open University. So I'm really delighted that these two fantastic scholars and generous scholars accepted to, to, to be here with us. Uh, thank you so much. And I'll give the floor to Eve uh, and then Pierre will start the discussion for about 10, 15 minutes. We're done for 10, 15 minutes. Great. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to show some slides. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Truly, truly wonderful. Thank you for the fantastic invitation from Ivana and for all of you uh, who made the effort to come this afternoon. Pierre for giving his comments. I'm thanking you in advance. I hope that you will not That's destroy right. me. <laughs> uh, and I had a wonderful session this morning and into the afternoon with some younger scholars. And so I've already learned an extraordinary amount about some of the aspects and programming associated with Table. So it's a really great, obviously extraordinary group of scholars coming together in this collaborative, generous environment to share work. So it's uh, something's very special here. So it's my honor to be uh, presenting today. Um, we just got the slideshow rolling. There you go. Thank you very much. Um, as many of you know, the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, the IPPC, IPCC, was established in 1988 by the United Nations to monitor and assess all global science related to climate change. Over the years, it has issued important global reports. The latest issued last year in April, titled Mitigation of Climate Change, was the third installment in a three-part report. And I know that many of you know these reports very, very well. Together, the three sub-reports, authored by hundreds of climate science scholars and endorsed by 195 member states of the UN, reflect worldwide consensus by scientists and governmental organizations on the climate emergency. They make clear that burning fossil fuels is the primary cause of planetary warming uh, and that to, we must stop immediately the burning at the scale we are if we are to avoid going above and beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now, the, this April report that came out last year was interesting because despite the clear scientific consensus, this latest installment downplayed the looming uh, cat catastrophic and uh, planetary warming. Working against the earlier sub-reports, the April document emphasized techno fixes that the earlier reports had argued were scientifically very dubious. And more disturbing still, it projected long-term reliance on fossil fuels and assumed that the temperatures would go above 1.5 degrees Celsius in the coming five to eight years. As a result, its suggestions for mitigation were limited, citing lack of political will on behalf of government leaders as being a central obstacle to reducing global warming. Lack of political will. So let's just, I just want you to hold that. That's what they said. Notably in the days before the final release of its executive summary, there were intense behind the scene negotiations and political pressures exerted by the major carbon emitting countries, Australia, Germany, the United States, and China. These countries wanted references to the techno fixes to be reprioritized as well as the removal of any references to rich industrialized nations being responsible for planetary warming. The fossil fuel industry also wanted uh, any removal of references to its decades of misinformation, disinformation about the um, uh, impacts of fossil fuel burning. These highly politicized negotiations illustrate the growing tensions between the clear and urgent need to rapidly phase out fossil fuels and the reluctance of global decision makers to acknowledge or act on that need. As one commentator put it very succinctly, quote, politics is still getting in the way of climate science, even in a report that discusses the way politics are getting in the way of climate science. <laughs> and one of my heroes, uh, the UN uh, Secretary General, Antonio Gutierrez, this is what he says in a tweet that some of you may remember. The latest IPCC report is a litany of broken promises, 
Um, some government business leaders are saying one thing, but doing another, they are lying. It's, it's time to stop burning the planet, right? So very frustrated. He's oft often on Twitter uh, and declaring such magnificent statements, but there he is. And in a sense, this story about the IPCC latest negotiations and the politics involved behind the scenes uh, provides a backdrop to my new book, which came out uh, about a year ago, Global Burning. The book explores the connections between the global rise of anti-democratic politics and the escalation of planetary warming. As political leaders and big businesses work together in the pursuit of profits and power, anti-environmental policies, including science denial and skepticism, have become essential political tools enabling the rise of extreme right politicians. And I call this collusion between big business and typically uh, I'm really talking about big oil and some finance sectors here. I call the collusion between big oil and political governance, free market authoritarianism. And I argue that the biggest factor in the upswing of our warming pl planet is an extreme right wing national leaders who embrace anti-democratic priorities and economic privileges of global capitalism. These leaders, characteristically are all involved in um, deregulating environmental protections. They're very much about uh, uh, not supporting renewable uh, energy production. And together they are the lack of political will that the IPCC report was sort of hinting at, right? It didn't go into any details, but that's what the, the message is about this lack of political will. So the book, um, is my attempt to engage with what I see as two global trends that are emerging and have emerged in the last 10 to 15 years. The first trend is a declining, uh, worldwide decline in liberal democratic governance, right? And we see this most obviously, of course, and dramatically in the United States, um, but it's happening around the world. And, you know, the, the Freedom House, which is a, a, a watchdog organization in, in Washington, D.C., and VDEM, which is in Sweden, they have a whole sort of set of criteria about how they are monitoring the decline of democratic governance. And there is definitely and consistently a downward swing, right? And so their reports are very illuminating and very horrifying. And the second global trend I was trying to, to explore is increasing catastrophic weather events, bushfires, floods, hurricanes, droughts, all of which are uh, emblematic of planetary warming, right? And so I sort of focused on the fires and I'll explain why in a little bit. And what I was trying to do in the book is connect the political erosion of liberal democracies with the escalating corrosion, insidious corrosion, often unseen corrosion of the environment, right? So that was sort of the, the whole point. Um, and I argue that this collusion between um, capitalists and politicians, of course, has happened in the past, and most obviously in the turn of the 19th into the 20th century, and in the US, of course, with the Robert Barons, Rockefeller, and Stanford, and Carnegie. But the, the, the unique moment uh, is, there, we are in a unique moment, because never before has this collusion occurred on such a global scale, implemented through largely unregulated international finance and legal systems. And never before has it been understood by millions of millions of ordinary people through a global social media landscape that pumps out ultra-nationalist ideology, disinformation, and certainly in the United States, incredibly crazy conspiracy theories, right? So there, there are echoes in the current moment with previous historical periods, uh, and we can all, you know, sort of talk about those, but I'm arguing in the book that we're in a particular moment that is truly unique and that the social media, uh, global social media is part of it, but also a sort of uh, wave of anti-democratic leaders who learn from each other, who use their own strategies, who communicate together, um, and the the rise of post-truth landscape, right? It's a, it's, it's a unique phenomenon. So my book connects the political erosion of liberal democracies with the corrosion of the environment. And my underlying is concern is that people's ability to push back against increasingly authoritarian politicians is being reduced as political and legal avenues to protect rights and affect change are slowly slipped away. And in some cases dismantled quite radically and dramatically. This growing inability to protest 
is, a is happening with respect to environmental justice issues. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit in my talk. But it is, of course, also happening uh, to a range of deeply entangled rights, such as the right to vote, the right to reproductive autonomy, the right to freedom from racial discrimination. So while my book is about um, the climate emergency, it's also about interconnected abuses of human rights and the global attack on the basic principles of democratic and social justice. Um, and so I, I'm really trying, and I'll, I'll sort of hopefully uh, pull this out for you in the, in the future slides, but to connect climate justice and what's happening on that front with other kinds, kinds of social injustices that are typically not associated with the climate. The climate and the narrative about the climate emergency is often uh, sort of discreet and demarcated, um, but I'm arguing that it's part of a suite of, of abuses um, on liberal democratic principles um, more generally. Okay, I think I have stuck. Okay, um, so you, you know, you probably heard from my accent, I'm Australian. And so this is also a very personal story. Um, I was last in Australia in December in 2019 um, and huge, huge bushfires, you know, broke out across the whole continent. And, you know, as an Australian, you're very used to bushfires. I grew up with bushfires, um, but really the scale and the enormity of the destruction in December 2019 going into early 2020 was incredibly profoundly different from anything that Australians had ever experienced before. This is just an image, of course, of the Sydney Opera, but it was the whole continent was so shrouded in smoke and ashes and this horrifying dim uh, sunlight. And I have to show you my koala pictures because there were billions of animals that, of course, were destroyed, uh, huge swaths of, of forest and rainforest. Uh, and this fire was really on the outskirts of major cities like Sydney, so it wasn't sort of just in the bush. Um, it really creeped up into suburbia, and this was a whole new sort of way of dealing with, with wildfire in Australia. This is a slide just to sort of indicate the scale of the fires, because you had fires at the same time in Siberia, uh, in, the, in the Amazon. Um, but the, 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 the Australian fires were double even the biggest fires going on elsewhere. So that's just to give you a sense of it because, you know, we typically don't sort of talk about these fires, but they're the biggest fires in, in living history that erupted across one continent at the same time. <clears throat> so I come back from uh, visiting family in, in December 2019 to the United States, and I live in Southern California, and Southern California is on fire, right? So I'm thinking, oh, you know, uh, and also in Southern California, you have lots of fires all the time. It's a very, very sort of hot Mediterranean climate. Um, and the Siberian fires were going on. This is one of the, the these images from uh, Global Fire Watch. It's this sort of live website that you can see the fires that are burning around the world at any one time. And it sort of got me thinking about how we how we describe the catastrophic fires that are occurring, because it's typically very much the fires over in Australia, the fires in the Amazon, the fires in Southern California. And to me, it was this is a global phenomenon that we don't typically think about it in those terms. So I wanted to compare big catastrophic fires in Australia to the burning of the Amazon in Brazil, though not entirely in Brazil, or only in Brazil, and in the Southwest of the United States. These are some images of the Amazon. And as some of you know, it has been burning. It has been burning at an extraordinary rate for some years. Um, uh, and her, the images are horrific. I mean, this is sort of considered the, the lungs of the planet. It's an incredibly important uh, ecosphere, environmental sphere for uh, carbon emissions reduction. Um, and uh, under, and I'll, under, you know, Bolsonaro, the former far right leader, uh, he came to power on a political campaign that promised mining corporations and agribusiness companies that he would allow the Amazon to burn for their uh, access to land, right? And of course, the, the results of the mining uh, and the deforestation are extraordinarily destructive in terms of toxics and seepage and mercury uh, poisoning and so on. And of course, also disproportionately impacts many indigenous peoples. So there are 17 so-called reservation lands that are designated under the Brazilian constitution in which indigenous peoples are allowed to live. 
uh, uh, un, undisturbed, and many of the uh, rights of indigenous peoples have been completely violated as state uh, military and, and mercenary groups come in and at you know, gunpoint actually push people off their lands. So this is a horrifying story. Um, uh, and as I say, very much disproportionately impacts certain uh, poorer and marginalized communities. This is a, a figure that's important to remember because many of the environmental protectors um, are being killed, certainly across uh, Latin America, South America. And you can see there the countries, uh, Colombia, Mexico, the Philippines, Brazil, they have, this is in 2020, the number of people who were shot and killed trying to uh, ensure the, their territories were not taken over by mining, co mining corporations. Um, it's a very, very disturbing trend, right? So that these protesters in the Amazon region and other places, Peru, and then of course India, are being killed in, in their attempts to defend their lands from uh, mining. So I compare Brazil uh, with the United States, as I say, this is Los Angeles, uh, fires break out all the time, um, really very, very close to, to neighborhoods. I live in a very suburban area and about three months ago, uh, a fire roared up a mountainside and 12 houses were burnt. Um, very close, the whole sky is filled with smoke, helicopters dumping, fire retardant and so on. So it's something that we live with all the time. The University of California where I'm at, uh, we are evacuated uh, very regularly throughout the summer months. So it's a constant, constant worry, uh, wildfire. Now, these fires have escalated in number and escalated in intensity. And of course, just like in Brazil, the peoples that are most impacted by these wildfires in Southern California are typically the migrant workers. This California uh, agricultural area supplies about 60% of the food, uh, vegetables and, and fruit for the entire country. So it's sort of considered the, the agricultural hub of the United States. Many of these migrant workers are undocumented and many of them were forced throughout all these horrifying fires at gunpoint to continue that they had to pick the strawberries and so on, right? And of course, there's horrifying stories of their lungs being burnt and everything, but you know, they don't have much power. They're forced to work even through uh, uh, wildfire season. So what I tried to do, and, and this is laid out in the first chapter of the book, I tried to think about fire in different ways than we normally do. Um, so I argue that we need to think about fire, we need to think with fire, and we need to think through fire. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. So thinking about fire, this is the normal way that people approach catastrophic weather events. You know, the empirical data, how many fires, how long did they burn, where did they burn, who did they impact most, what are the political, social, economic conditions in which fires occurred? And this is all extremely important materials. And that's how, you know, the earth scientists uh, at my campus and other places, of course, think about fire, trying to actually get data on it, and in a sense, try to capture and provide a solution. So they're thinking about fire in a very sort of empirical sense. And in my book, I argue that we actually also have to think with fire. And by that, I mean that we need to, to, to highlight the relational dimensions that we as humans have with the natural world, including wildfires, right? And this is my attempt to try as many scholars in uh, ecofeminist scholars and uh, scholars of the Anthropocene. And of course, today we have wonderful uh, you know, papers in, in progress that picked up some of these ideas of overcoming the, the modernist human nature binary that really predominates the way we think about wildfires, right? So we tend to think about wildfires on land and that we can find a, a solution. We can control the land, we can bring in, you know, helicopters with retardants and firefighters and so on. Uh, and I'm saying that we actually need to get beyond that very, very uh, deeply embedded in our legal system notion that we are the humans, we are in charge, we control nature, we own the property on which fire occurs. Um, and we need to get past that. So, you know, as I say, ecofeminists, you know, uh, have, have long talked about the binary uh, dualisms that dominate a sort of Euro-American Western modernist framework. Um, and, you know, human and nature 
is, the, is an obvious one, but law, lawful and lawless, male and female, mind and body, these are the dualisms of the Western Enlightenment modernist project. And I'm trying to argue in the book that we actually need to overcome, transcend uh, the limitations of that kind of binary thinking and have a much more encompassing, holistic relationship uh, centered notion with the natural environment or world in which we do not control. And in fact, as many theorists are now arguing, the natural world, ultimately it has agency, will control humanity, right? Uh, that it has an agency um, that is very much unrecognized in our modern legal system. And I'm picking up on people here like Donna Haraway, who talks about nature cultures. It's a one word rather than nature and culture. It's, it, she makes it a combined word. And she talks about, of course, our relationship with the natural non-human world as one of kinship, which I think is a very important word here that underscores that what's happening out there in the more than human world is part of how we actually have to think about our community and our way of living. So that's my sort of intervention about we need to think with fire as a relationship. And then I also argue that we need to think through fire. And this has spatial dimensions and temporal dimensions. Thinking through fire, I try to argue that um, we need to think about the earth systems uh, uh, and, and the impacts of catastrophic fire that transcend national borders, right? This is not something that's contained within our, again, modernist framework of how we think about jurisdictions and laws and borders and national uh, uh, boundaries. But there's a spatial dimension to catastrophic climate, planetary warming that completely is uncontrolled and transcends all our ways of, of legal thinking. And the temporal dimensions, which again was picked up in papers this morning so beautifully, we need to think with fire, we need to think through fire, and we need to understand its temporal dimensions, right? So what is happening in the current moment with climate crisis, of course, builds on long, long, long histories of extractive capitalism, both extractive of, of natural resources, but extractive of human labor. Um, this is just a picture that gives you a sense the Australian continent on fire, as it were, and the smoke climbing up into these huge atmospheric rivers. And of course, the, the, the pollutants and, the, and the, the gunk in the air falling into other continents, falling into seas, and then of course, seas taking uh, uh, the, the, the pollutants in different trajectories too. So this is completely a different kind of territorial, uh, more terrestrial kind of understanding the impacts of catastrophic fires. And this to me is a picture that goes to the temporality argument I'm trying to make. Um, uh, uh, colonialism in the United States, and you have both the extraction of natural resources, the timber and lumber being forest being deforested, but of course using extractive labor uh, uh, through uh, African slaves themselves. So I wanna say that this long time scale cannot be dismissed in our thinking about the contemporary climate crisis, right? Because the afterlife of slaveries and colonialism and extractivism are actually what we have to deal with in the current moment as well. And that's typically not discussed when we're thinking about catastrophic wildfires. So in a sense, this is a picture of the Amazon of fire. What I'm trying to say is what's going over there in the Amazon, in the horrors of the, of the burning of the rainforest, is connected to things such as Black Lives Matter, right? And the global movement uh, around, you know, that erupted with George Floyd's um, uh, death. And that you, when you can't breathe in the Amazon, uh, you also, that notion of can't breathe, it's also in terms of urban living in the United States and cities and policing um, of, of and, and racializing of policing in the United States and elsewhere. So it's connecting spaces and times and logics of extractivism um, that inform the current moment. So let us go to the three countries here. Um, as some of you know, Scott Morrison was the prime minister of Australia. He's no longer the prime minister of Australia. Uh, Bolsonaro was narrowly, narrowly defeated earlier this year uh, uh, and Donald Trump. And all three of these leaders in 2020 were extraordinarily on the same page in terms of their anti-environmental policies and strategies. Scott Morrison, 
uh, this is a picture that I can't help but show you. This is not when he, he was a, a couple of years before he became prime minister. He's considered to be very much a puppet of the mining industry. And he did this extraordinarily sort of a frivolous and stupid stunt by bringing into the parliament a lump of coal and juggling it in front of the uh, environmental green party and saying oh who's afraid of coal now you know and damned by international environmental activist david attenborough just about fell out of uh his his off his chair in his anger at the sort of stupidity because you know Scott Morrison really truly is a puppet of the mining industry. And he came to power pledging that he would support uh, further um, mining and gas drilling across the continent in Australia. Australia's economy is based on mining, almost exclusively now. Um, similarly, Bolsonaro came to power promising the mining companies and big agribusinesses that he would, as I say, deforest uh, the Amazon on their behalf. And Donald Trump came in very much publicizing that he was for coal, he was going to bring back um, economic uh, wealth to the former coal mining areas of the of the, of the United States. Of course, it never happened, um, but that is very much appealing to a sort of white, um, uh, very disenfranchised, poor rural communities that had, you know, been hit hard by the rolling back of the coal industry in the United States. So these three people are leading campaigns that are extremely anti-environmental. And I argue that there's a unique convergence here in the 21st century. And these are just three people, and we can all think of other three uh, far-right leaders. The three people that I, that they're all very much pushing ultra-nationalist um, uh, policies, racialized national identities, anti-immigrant policies. So they're extremely xenophobic in the way that they campaigned, in the way that they actually governed the respective countries. All three leaders um, withdrew from multilateral uh, uh, obligations or just ignored them. Um, as we know, Trump actually took the United States out of the Paris Agreement and the World Health Organization. Biden then returns the United States to those organizations, but an extraordinary disregard for international responsibilities and multilateral collaborations um, all three leaders are very, very, or were very, very savvy in terms of using social media um, and aggressively uh, spreading disinformation and falsehoods without any sense of concern. All three were very much uh, in terms of land grabbing, particularly in the global south um, and supporting that. And all three were very much about decreasing the judicial uh, autonomy of the, of the courts, attacking voting rights, um, defunding public education, uh, and so on. What I argue in the book that those, those you know, uh, points in white are, are sort of more mainstream. People are seeing that the, 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 these far-right leaders are doing such things. But what I sort of in, argued in the book and what was concerning me at the time is no one was also connecting it to the anti-environmental policies they were all pushing because this to me is a sort of a, 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 an arena, a sort of a policy sector that had gone under the radar, right? So all three leaders are extremely anti-environmental, and anti-environmental, they're skeptical of climate science. Um, all three, uh, in various ways, backed police and military force against citizens protesting environmental degradations, right? And all three, of course, learned from each other, sharing strategies, right? And it's not just these three, but this is a, a unique convergence of these uh, very, very far-right leaders um, being in quite direct communication on how they're actually controlling and managing uh, their government systems. So while all three, and this is the moment of optimism, all three leaders are no longer in power, right? Um, Lula, as I said, came in very, very, very narrow margin, uh, came in uh, above Bolsonaro uh, and won the election. But all three uh, leaders, not so much Morrison, um, but Bolsonaro and Trump continue to have an extraordinary impact and continuing power over their political parties, even if they're not uh, themselves in office. And within Australia, Albanese, who's the new prime minister on the left, the Labour, um, he is trying, but he actually has a great deal of difficulty getting any traction on rolling back many of the anti-environmental regulations uh, that uh, Scott Morrison brought in in favour of mining corporations. 
So, you know, I love this picture. I particularly like the Australia, the one with Scott Morrison looking like such a fool. Um, and to me, it reminds, you know, I'm telling this story with my students, it's a good reminder they have to vote, right? Because still the election system did uh, bring down the fall of these three people, um, but their power and their influence and what they did while they were in office continues to wreak havoc in terms of any pro-climate legislation uh, and strategies that the new leaders can bring in. Biden has had an extraordinarily uh, difficult time he has put in a lot of money into the infrastructure and you know renewable energies, but he also is constantly being forced to uh, uh, comply. And you know, some of you may know that he's just okayed the Willow Project, which is the the you know opening up of Alaska to to gas and mining leases. Very very distressing for many many people. Um, so that he's sort of has his hands tied on many fronts. He's tried. He came in on a pro climate campaign. He hasn't done what many people had hoped he would be able to do, which is an indicator also that, you know, once Trump gave out all these leases for mining, you can't take the leases back. It's very difficult. So now I want to talk about the power of big oil. And I'm going to focus a little bit on the US because that's where I know the most. But the power of big oil is very much part of the global conversation about why there is this lack of political will. Right? Remember, it's always going back to why is this lack of political will? Because those IPCC reports said we can make a difference, we can mitigate climate change, except for this lack of political will. So big oil is a big factor, right? And just to give you a sense of it, we have Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, and the winners, of course, are the big oil companies, right? So they are made huge profits in the last year, Un unbelievable profits as the rest of uh, the world, in, and they really has had a global impact in many ways of that the, the invasion, as we know, in terms of uh, uh, energy availability and access, but of course, you know, Ukraine's um, production of grains and so on has basically put the uh, African continent into extreme famine. But big oil is the winner. And in here, you know, you have to remember Naomi Klein and disaster capitalism, a long story told, you know, tens of, over 10 years ago. But there is the oil companies. They're always going to be the winners. They seem to be always the winners when there is conflict uh, and disaster, whether it's natural or uh, human-made conflict. And as many of you know, the big oil companies have been uh, involved in an extremely effective disinformation campaign for decades, right? Uh, and there's been quite a lot of literature on this, um, how they knew in the early 80s, actually early seven, late 70s, early 80s, the impact of burning fossil fuels. And that was already scientific evidence that the planet was warming at that time. Uh, and the book, you know, in my book, I talk a lot about how they, as soon as the, the oil companies knew that the science was going to go against them and, and, and display the, what, what they were doing was, you know, causing planetary warming, they went into an extraordinary global campaign um, with, you know, think tanks and promotion of certain kinds of scholarship to say that fossil fuel burning really didn't make any difference, right? And they learned a lot in their strategies from the big tobacco companies who also in a very, very aggressive disinformation campaign. So this is this is well documented. They're, you know, Exxon and, and Shell, they, a lot of their internal um, notes and memos show that they knew exactly what was going on and that they still, you know, they, that they, they deliberately hid that and went on a very big advertising campaign. Uh, and of course, you know, worked with the car companies and so on. This is a, a, an image that I think will just help you understand the degree to which the fossil fuel big oil companies own American politics. So this is um, the top uh, five um, uh, contributors by the fossil fuel contributors to the political campaign uh, in 2020. And of course, you see here pink and red is very much the reds, the Republicans, and then the pink is the conservative think tanks and networks. Um, and then the blue, of course, is the, the Democrats. And I'm not wanting to say that the Democrat Party doesn't take some campaign funds from some big oil, right? 
but the degree to which you can see the, the, the Republicans completely uh, campaign financed by big oil, the, 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 the difference is extraordinary, right? So the Republican Party is now entirely bought and sold, I mean, bought and, and, and is a puppet of big oil. This is another way to look at it. So in the 1990, um, both the Republicans and the Democrats were pretty much equal in terms of um, their receiving of campaign funding uh, and contributions from the oil and gas industry. And politically, they were both very much sort of on the same path, saying that fossil fuels was bad, right? Um, despite the, the disinformation campaigns by oil and gas companies. But you see here over 22 years, the extraordinary amount of money being pumped into <clears throat> the Republican Party versus the Democrats, right? Um, and that's just a sort of different way of looking at how it's changed over time. And as you can imagine, coming up to the 2024 election, which has already uh, sort of swamped media attention in the United States. It's just like, oh my goodness, it's constant already. But big oil is behind a lot of the campaigns um, and finance up there. And in return for the campaign financing and the industrial um, monies that were put towards the Republicans and all sorts of ways, under Trump, big oil was well rewarded. Right, so he here see here the extraordinary tax uh, reductions he gave to big oil, right? And you can see there Exxon at the top, Chevron, and so on. So the, they got a lot from their money, money well spent. I, this is a political cartoon that's sort of horrifying, but there it is. Uh, you know, the the Trump going to make America first in terms of the being of the dirtiest country in the world. Trump also rolled back, managed to roll back 50 years of environmental protections in the United States, right? He gutted the Environmental Protection Agency. He took out all sorts of career scientists. He put in his own peoples. And you can see here the, the sectors in which they were rolling back. Air pollution emissions was the biggest, um, drilling and extraction. Uh, lots of biodiversity rules that were in place to protect animals were rolled back, um, and so on. I mean, it just you could see the the the, the sort of depth and degree to which he rolled back uh, legislative uh, accountability. Um, and many many of the people in the EPA, you know, wrote in very distressing terms about being fired and so on, uh, and not being able to stop the removal of any climate science from their reports. So about 100 pieces of legislation were taken off the books. Um, and what was interesting in the United States, this was very much under the radar. So as we know with Trump, it's a, it's a political circus all the time. It's deliberately chaotic, um, ricocheting off one catastrophe and one drama and one disgusting motion of you know, corruption and, and paying porn stars and all that sort of stuff. And it's a deliberate strategy because undercover, he was quietly doing all this rolling back of uh, climate change legislation, right? And very, very little conversation was happening about it. And it was deliberately done so under the radar, as I say. Also, what Trump did was enable many of the Republican-led states to put in legislation that deliberately targeted anyone protesting protesting either uh, aggressive policing or protesting environmental degradations or protesting the laying of huge gas pipelines across natural reservations and indigenous lands. And I'm just gonna read you a, a little bit here about this. Um, many of the state's legislation shares language drafted by the American Legislative Exchange Council, a right-wing group backed by fossil fuel companies, right? In Florida, South Dakota, and Oklahoma, for example, a riot is considered to be any unauthorized action by three or more people. While in Florida, Oklahoma, and Iowa, drivers who injure protesters blocking traffic, which is a common tactic used by environmental activists, are given legal immunity. So you can get in a car and you can crash into some green activists protesting and you do not actually uh, get charged. 
In Arkansas, an act of terrorism is considered to be anything that causes a, a substantial damage to a public monument, which could also include graffiti. Across 17 Republican controlled states, protesters face up to 10 years in prison and multi million dollar fines for offenses. The broad application of these anti protest laws, which you know are truly horrifying, um, as well uh, as accompanying legislation that criminalizes people and organizations, is that it chills activism and makes it riskier for people to be involved in their right to protest, right? And again, it's whether you're protesting about racism or you're protesting about toxins seeping into your water table, protesting in and of itself is now uh, being demonized. And those who actually are actively involved in taking down the protesters are being validated in their activities. You wouldn't believe it's true. You couldn't imagine it. And yet there are many cases now in which people get in cars and plow into environmental activists. And then Trump in a final sort of move, just as he's leaving office, stacks of course the Supreme Court with a very, very conservative majority of judges. So it's now six, three, six uh, extremely uh, politically conservative. And they brought down this um, uh, case in July of last year brought to the courts by Republican-led governors, and it basically guts the Environmental Protection Agency from controlling greenhouse gas emissions, right? So not only did Trump take out the career scientists and put in his own administrative uh, officials, he also empowered the Supreme Court to take down the Environmental Protection Agency's uh, capacities to actually put in new laws, right? So it's a very fine, uh, broad sweep of anti-environmental strategies and policies that he did across a whole number of sectors. So that's the US, very distressing. But this is the month of September last year. My birthday's on the 1st of September, so it was a month which I was quite distressed because of course in Europe, we also have many far right politicians coming into, into, into power. Also similarly, very anti-environmental in their policies and strategies. While uh, you know the Prime Minister um, Truss was ousted pretty quickly in a sort of just, just horrifying scene, a political scene, she was an Exxon, uh, you know, an ex uh, uh, Shell executive, and she put in a very, very disturbing um, uh, energy minister who was extremely anti-environment, big opponent of climate action, and the new prime minister is no better, right? In Italy, we have Giorgia Meloni coming in who has deep neo-fascist uh, roots um, and her whole party has been historically opposed to the EU plans to reduce gas emissions um, and she has opened up oil and gas leasing, right? There was fears at the time when I wrote the slide, but she has now done that. And then of course in Sweden, another far right leader comes in who was also associated uh, with anti-environmentalism, denouncing the Paris Agreement and pushing a, a, a climate skeptic strategy. So that's just in one month in Europe. And you can imagine, and we all know other places around the world in which similar far right leaders are coming into power or at least being able to exert power and bringing with them an anti-environment agenda, right? Anti-climate agenda. And then these are the COP, you know, 27, coming up COP 28 in November. Very, very disappointingly, as we all know in this room, held in Egypt and Saudi Arabia, basically a, a, a marketplace for oil and gas lobbyists to get together. It became their party. I know many environmental activists were basically sort of sidelined, put into rooms in which they really didn't have any uh, predominant say. And it became a sort of great big party for the lobbyists to get together and push their, you know, tips and trading secrets on leasing and oil and so on. So that in itself, the uh, uh, annual international meetings, which were so important for bringing together pro-climate uh, leaders and activists and grassroots communities and so on, has been themselves co-opted uh, by big oil. Very, very distressing uh, and that they're both held uh, last year and this year in big, big oil producing region of the world is an indicator of 
the sort of um, grossness and, and, and explicitness of uh, the power of big oil to co-opt even these meetings which are meant to be anti-oil, right? This is a, a report that came out very recently in March um, and sort of basically is reiterating the messages of the IPCC saying that we are truly in a crisis, right? And we all know this. Um, and I think it's a very sort of uh, powerful bid once again to try and get it into the media about what the emergency is. This latest report says what we all already know, um, that almost every region across the planet is experiencing climate extremes, that we are imminently going to overshoot 1.5 degrees Celsius. And, you know, by 2030, there's a, which is, you know, not very, we're 20, you know, seven years away, there's a 50% chance that global surface temperatures in every single year could exceed 1.5. So you, we all know there's, a, the, the alarm is being sounded. It is a code red uh, and it is not in any uh, material sense shifting the political leadership where it needs to shift, the political will is still not there, right? So, you know, this is where I think we have to take to the streets, despite in the US these anti-protest laws. I say to my students, you've got to get out there, you've got to protest, because this is the only way that we're going to make a difference. The, the political will has to come from the people, right? And we have to get out and mobilize in ways that the students are feeling very demoralized that I teach. Um, but I'm hopeful, I am hopeful. Uh, and for me in the United States, one of the sort of hopeful messages is that there is um, uh, 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 a connection now between environmental degradation, environmental injustices, and social and political injustices. So that my students, young people, are making those connections, that it's not just you can block off in the environment and the environmental issues that's happening over there and racism is happening over there and uh, anti-abortion legislation is happening over there. They themselves, I think, are becoming much more savvy to see that this is a united front, anti-democratic front that's affecting a lot of their civil and political rights to vote and so on, but also is part of the problem and why we're not making any advances in terms of climate mitigation. So that to me is the hopeful message. Um, uh, this is the unhopeful message that the very recently there was an environmental protector who was killed in the United States in Atlanta. So that whole notion of what's going on over with the people in the Amazon being killed as they defend their lands is also coming very much home to roost in the United States. I don't think that's that there's been any environmental protectors here in Europe that have been shot, but this was a young man that was shot defending um, a, a, an old plantation that had had a black prison on it, a slavery sort of plantation prison uh, that had been all overgrown. And the police in Atlanta wanted to clear um, this land and put in a police training camp. And then there you have the sort of uh, layering of racial capitalism and slavery and intergenerational injustices, and then the trees growing up and then they're going to be chopped down by a new round of anti-democratic practice and a very aggressive police force. And these protesters were in the trees and so on. Many of them were injured, but this young man was actually killed. Um, so it's a, it's a sort of a story that sort of brings all the stuff that's happening in the global south very much into the U.S. Uh, context. And for my students, this is extremely distressing and disturbing as it should be. And this is an image which I'm going to leave you with, which is not particularly optimistic. It's a, the, the fellow that, that painted this picture is called Matt Chinworth. And this is the title of his picture. Money is the oxygen on which the fire of global warming burns. And that, to me, sort of sums up the lack of political will. Right. And that's what we're up against in terms of thinking about climate mitigation more generally, about climate litigation and its effectiveness that we're dealing with a very, very powerful wave of anti-democratic governance that's insidiously, corrosively dismantling our civil political rights, including our rights to protest environmental degradation. So with that, um, thank you very much. <laughs>